Hello. Uh, good morning to all. This is our third lecture on uh, C++ programming brush up session for, uh, as a part of pre-placement training. And uh, it's actually a privilege to talk to you for three consecutive days and throw some light on uh, different topics related to object-oriented programming. Today, we will continue uh, with the remaining part. Uh, if you remember, I will recall uh, whatever we have discussed up till now uh, quickly, and then uh, we will continue with the uh, remaining concepts related to object-oriented programming. So let me share uh, my screen so that you will be able to see the things that we wanted to discuss uh, in the today. So if you remember, we are in discussion of member functions, types of member functions uh, that are supported uh, by object-oriented programming methodology. Uh, Non-static function, there can be static, non-inline, inline, constructor, destructor. Then there can be function overloading. There can be operator overload, friend function, virtual function, virtual function and function overriding so out of these all out of these all uh, functions that we can have inside object oriented programming what we have finished is we have finished these all in up till now as well as we finished function overloading now today we have to see these remaining things that is what is operator overloading fun friend function virtual function pure virtual function and overriding, function overriding. I hope uh, today my audio is clear as well as video is so clear. So I will quickly take you to the discussion. This we already discussed in the last session, if you remember, that who can do constructor also we discussed. It is a member function with same name of a class. Then we discussed about destructor also. It is also member function whose name is same as that of the class, but it starts with the symbol of tiled and the destructor can be virtual, constructor cannot be. Then we discussed about function overloading, where we can have many functions with same name, but different type signatures. They has to be member of a class. Then they do not require inheritance for implementation. Basically, they implement compile time polymorphism, right? Now, <coughs> to start today's session, uh, I will take this problem. So this problem will uh, give us understanding of more concept related to object oriented programming which is uh, necessary in order to proceed further and discuss about overloading so what we wanted to do is uh, we wanted to write object oriented program to perform addition of two complex numbers so this is the problem we wanted to perform addition of two complex number so addition is the operation that i wanted to perform on whom on complex number so complex number is nothing but what my object so I have recognized object required for my program so I will consider complex number as an object so now we require object as a complex number what are the attributes of the complex number any complex number can be very well explained or represented by using or by specifying it's a real part and it's a imaginary part so every complex number we can represent by using by specifying it's a real and imaginary part so i can understand that the data members required in the class will be real and imaginary then uh, as far as operation is concerned what are the member functions that we require in our class so i am analyzing the requirements so that we program by considering these all requirements. So this was missing in previous session, which I considered in this session so that you will um, get the idea about how the thinking should go in the proper direction. So I will decide to have a method input or function input, which will be used for reading data from user. Because uh, in my program, the operands are the complex numbers and uh, I should read real and imaginary part of first complex number, as well as I should read and uh, read real and imaginary part of second complex number also. Then we should have a member function addition, which will perform addition of two complex numbers to generate the result. And then I have decided to have 
one more member function that is display which will display the result of addition to the user so this is the analysis that i have done before we actually start writing program that we should have two uh, member mem data members the two data members required are the part and imaginary part and we will have three member functions that is input uh, addition and display. i hope you have understood how i analyzed and decided to have things now let us actually consider the problem mathematically we can have complex number 1 and which will be let us say in this form 5 plus i6 then we can complex number entered where user will enter real part as 3 and imaginary part as 9 so complex number is in fact 3 plus i to store this complex number 1 we require one object so we will create object let's say c1 so c1 object will be used to store the first complex number to store the second complex number we require another object so we will declare or create another object c2 which will store the second complex number that is second operand and then uh, we need to add them and the addition will give me one more new complex number which will be the result of addition so we require third object also so this is important. to perform addition of two complex number and store the result we require c1 and c2 as the opera we wanted to perform addition of c1 and c2 and addition of c1 and c2 we need to store into entirely new object that is c3 so that we will get the result here real part of the result and imaginary part of the result i hope this is also clear to all now let us look into the diagram of the objects so i will have object uh, c1 let us consider this is object c1 then this of separate copy of r and i then we will have object c2 which will also have separate copy of r and i we will have object c3 which will also have separate copy of r and i so every object will get separate copy data members and all objects are sharing uh, member functions so they all will share member functions input addition and display okay now when we will say uh, i wanted to read first complex number how we will read first complex number in our program we will read it uh, by calling function input so if i call a function input by writing just input then this will not work because uh, in this case the compiler compiler will get confused because input is simply accessing r and i and the compiler will not be able to decide whose r and i should be accessed so in order to initialize c1 we should call input on object c1 like this we should say c1 dot input so when i say c1 dot input what will happen to the input function only c1 will be visible but c2 and c3 will not be visible because we called input function by using object c1 so only c1 is visible c1 and c2 are uh, sorry c2 and c3 are not visible they are invisible have you understood this so now the input function will execute it will ask the user enter real and imaginary part user will enter real part as 5 that 5 will be stored over here then user will enter imaginary part 6 that 6 will be stored over here initialization of c1 object is over then how we will initialize c2 object to initialize the c2 object again we need to call input function but this time we will call input function as c2 dot input because we wanted to initialize the c2 object so we will call the input function by using the function call c2 dot input have you understood this c2 dot input so when i call it by using c2 dot input what will happen in this case input function will be able to see only c2 only c2 object c1 will not be visible to input function as well as c3 will not be visible to input function so now again input function input function will execute it will ask the user enter real and binary part so let's assume user will enter 3 as a 
the part so that will be stored over here and nine as the imagine part so that will be stored over here so we have initialized c2 object also so c1 is initialized c is initialized now our aim is to um, addition so now we need to call function addition and now here the problem starts what will happen if i call a uh, function addition and uh, what is required to be used to call the function addition so can i call it on c1 object can i call function uh, addition on c1 object what will happen if i call the function on c1 object are you able to tell me what will happen if i call function addition on c1 objects if suppose if i c1 c1 dot addition as and call in my program then what will happen as per the rules just now we have discussed what will happen only c1 object will be visible c2 and c3 will not be visible so this will be visible this will not this will not be visible and then will we be able to perform addition of two objects no so this is not a correct way then should i say c2 dot addition even that will also not solve the problem because if i say c2 dot addition then only c2 will be visible c1 and c3 will be invisible then can i say c3 dot addition yes i can think of this option when we say c3 dot addition what happen c3 will be visible be visible to the member function addition c will be directly visible c1 and c2 will not be visible but again the problem persists if c and c2 are not visible how the addition will perform addition of two operands so the solution is we need to pass object c1 and object c2 as a parameter to the function addition so c1 and c2 <coughs> will be sent as a parameter so c3 will be directly visible to the function addition whereas c1 and c2 are sent as a parameter so they are indirectly visible they are indirectly visible in form of their copies in form of their copies so we need to create the these this this will be considered as actual parameters in the function definition we require formal parameters let's say i am using formal parameter um, uh, x and y or let's say again c1 and c2 so it will create a copy of c1 and it will create a copy of c2 and then in this function addition we can perform addition of real parts addition of real parts of c1 and c2 and then we can store it into c3 similarly we can perform addition of imaginary parts of c1 and c2 and we can store the result in the imaginary part so but then i hope you have understood the problem uh, this problem came because of the rule uh, that if i call any member function on an object then only that object will be visible other objects will not be visible so if i want to make them visible inside a function we should better pass them as a parameter so i hope this complete analysis which i have did over here uh, is clear to all and then i will uh, switch to the uh, turbo c window so that you will be able to see this particular concept okay so we need to write uh, this program quickly so that uh, we can go ahead with the remaining things okay so uh, let me start writing the program uh, of uh, this parameter passing i will write hash include iostream.h then i will write hash include conio.h right then if you remember we need to create a class whose name is let's say complex and then we have already decided that this class will have two data members <coughs> so let's two data members are r and i real part and imaginary part then if you remember we have also decided to have three uh, member functions for this class so first member function void input 
and we we'll input function is uh, expected to read numbers not any binary part from the user so here i will give a message to the user that enter real and imaginary parts so we are not reading the symbol i plus i over here we are just reading the real part r and imaginary part i right so then we need to define a method whose name is addition so let's write a method whose name is addition okay i will keep this particular function pending we will come back to this function later on we need to define a member function whose name will be display and this is a simple member function which will display simply the result like this. let's say addition is equal to and then it will display real part of the addition then we will say plus i that is representation of the complex number and then i will display the imaginary part of the addition we will close this class and then we will proceed to function main so i will write function main like this void main clear the screen clr scr and then while analyzing them we have already decided how many objects we should create Uh, it was very clear that we require uh, at least three objects let's create the three objects for the class complex let's say c1 c2 and c3 these will be the three objects created in the class complex now i wanted to initialize object c1 to initialize object c1 i should say c1 dot input so when i say uh, c1 dot input we already analyze that c1 will be visible whereas c2 and c3 will be invisible this is the inherent rule of object oriented programming if you call a method on a particular object then only that object will be visible right to avoid the confusion to the compiler otherwise it will not understand where it should keep the value of r and where it should keep the value of i so it is extreme requirement that when we call method by or function by using object only that object will be visible and this particular rule will is going to create a problem for me later on so we need to solve it then i can initialize second object c2 object by writing c2 dot input like this so in this case what will happen is c2 will be visible but c1 and c3 will be invisible the uh, method or the function will not be able to access c1 and uh, c3 sorry the it will be able to access only c2 it will not be able to access c1 and c3 and now the next thing i have to call addition function so to call addition i cannot say simply addition like this we have to call the addition function on some uh, object and then we will decide to have or call method addition by using c3 object because ultimately i want addition method should uh, perform the addition and store the result in inside the c3 object so i will call c3 dot addition when i say c3 dot addition automatically what will happen c3 will be visible c3 will be visible to the addition method that means inside the addition method if i write r by default this will be considered as r of c3 or when i write i by default it will be considered imaginary part of c3 object the question is we require real and imaginary parts of c1 and c2 also what we will do is we will pass c1 and c2 as the parameters to the function now c1 and c2 are passed as a parameter so c1 and c2 will be indirect indirectly visible to the function addition how when i when i send from here as a actual parameter actually happen this is call by value the values will be transferred and to accept that values we require same type of variables over here so let's say i wanted to have variable x and y so that uh, x will receive value of c1 and y will receive value of c2 but then uh, in this in the function header we cannot uh, only specify name of the variables 
we need to specify their data types also and the data type specified over here should match with the data type of this now the question is what is type of c1 or what is data type of c2 you answer uh, this question quickly on uh, the comment box so i am uh, waiting for your answers i hope uh, today i am clearly audible so start answering i want answer to the question that just now i asked what is data type of c1 and c2 so that i can specify prime data type for x and y what is data type of c1 and c2 so that i will use same data type for x and y what will be the data what will be the data type of x and y i think nobody is answering answer it quickly so that i can move ahead no answers it is a very simple question what is data type of c1 and c2 yeah uh, yes i started getting answers jinal says float jasmin says complex soham says long mrudula says complex so c1 and c2 are objects of class complex so data type will be complex absolutely right so uh, jinal and soham it's not float or it's not long c1 and c2 Uh, uh if you see very carefully over here when we declared c1 and c2 what we specified as the data type we specified a data type as a complex it is as good as say uh, for example when i write int a then if i ask you a question what is data type of a you will say data type of a is int similarly when we declare c1 c2 and c3 what we have written over here complex that means data type of c1 c2 and c3 is complex they are objects of the class complex so now x and y are required to be of same type they should be complex so i will write uh, complex x and i will write complex y have you understood why i have written complex x and complex y okay now uh, c1 will get called into x so if i want to access real part of c1 here i cannot c1 dot real because uh, c1 not actually directly visible over here c1 will be visible in form of object x so instead of writing c1 dot r what i should write is x dot r plus i wanted to add the real real part of uh, c2 but i cannot say c2 dot r because c2 is not directly visible it is also indirectly visible in form of object y so better i should write that uh, y dot r so this will add real part of c2 with a real part of c1 and it will be stored into r but in whose r definitely c3 because c3 is directly visible similar i can add imaginary parts to add imaginary parts what do is i will write x dot i that is imaginary part of c plus 
uh, y dot i that will be imaginary part c2 and the addition will be stored in i which is imaginary part c3 and then finally i hope you have understood what why the objects are required to be passed as the parameters because they are not visible directly but they are required in the function so we should send them as a parameters so that indirectly they will be visible in form of their uh, counterparts that is formal parameters so c1 and c2 are actual parameters they are objects their counterparts are x and y formal parameters so x corresponds to c1 and corresponds to c2 so whenever i wanted to access parts of i should use x and whenever i wanted to access parts of i should use y so this complete concept i hope you have understood. now i should display the result by writing c3 dot display so obviously when i say c3 dot display only c3 will be visible directly to the function display and then this r and i will be considered of object c3 right so i hope you have understood the concept of passing objects as the parameters i will just write get ch at the end and i will close the main and then uh, we will compile our program like this okay and then we will run it so when we run it it is asking real and imaginary parts so let's say five and six are the real and, real and imaginary parts of first complex number and then let's say three and seven are the real and imaginary parts of second complex number and when i press enter what i will get is addition is equal to five plus three eight real part of uh, addition plus i six plus seven that is 13 that is imaginary part of the addition so i hope you have understood this particular concept where we discussed about passing objects as parameters okay so i hope this concept is clear i will move ahead with the next concept that is called as operator overloading so this is another very important feature of c++ object oriented programming uh, which is missing in python so python uh, sorry which is missing in java java doesn't support uh, operator overloading concept so operator overloading is uh, basically like a function overloading now uh, what do you mean by operator overloading and why it is required the requirement is uh, see when i want uh, to perform operation on basic data type variables for example i am having a basic data type variable let's say int is a basic data type and i am having variables let's say x and i will have another variable let's say y then can we perform addition of these two variables directly by writing x plus y the answer is yes what is the operator that i am using over here i am using addition operator so we can perform addition of two basic data type variables directly by writing plus operator plus instead of these are basic data type variables if i consider x and y r of complex then what this type complex complex is the class it is a user defined data type and then x and y are objects so if they are objects can we directly write x plus y the answer is because the plus operator or addition operator is mint or any operator in C++ mint only for operating on basic data type variable. You cannot operate them on object type user, which is user defined data type variable. But then I wanted to do this. I wanted to uh, write something like this. Let's say Z is equal to X and Y where X plus Y where Z is the object x is also object y is also object. then compiler doesn't allow you to do this directly then i can do it by using operator loading we can overload addition operator to perform addition of two objects so what is the basic job of addition operator basic job is to perform addition of two basic data type values or basic data type variables and how it is overloaded it is being asked to perform addition of two user defined data type variables like objects so this is something called as operator overloading but for the operator overloading what we require is passing object as a parameter just now which we have discussed now let us quickly go through the uh, 
operator overloading. It is the process of defining operator function. So this is a special type of function we need to define as a member function inside a class. So it is the process of defining operator function in order to make use of operator on objects of a class. In order to make use of operator on the objects of a class is known as operator overloading. So I hope you have understood the definition. Now, how to do this, how to define the operator function. The syntax for defining operator function is like this. It is a normal function which can have or which will have or some return type. Then the name of this function is very, very specific. You have to use a word operator as it is. You cannot give any other name to this function. You have to use a word operator followed by the symbol of that operator. Means what? The name of the function which is overloading addition operator will be operator and this symbol will be replaced by plus sign so it is operator plus and it may take parameters as per the requirements so i hope you have understood syntax for a declaring operator function so uh, this operator function can be used to uh, overload almost uh, all types of operators that are supported in c plus plus but there are some exceptions the exceptions are this we cannot overload scope resolution operator. We cannot overload member access operator. We cannot overload member access through pointer operator. And we cannot overload ternary operator. So this is an important question that can be asked in your interview. That do you know operator overloading concept in C++? If you explain it like this, it is OK. Then the next question will be, do you know which operators you cannot overload and the list should be known to you you cannot overload scope resolution you cannot overload access you cannot overload member access through pointer and you cannot overload ternary conditional operator then there is another thing that it is possible to change the precedence it is not possible to change the precedence grouping or number of operands of operators you cannot change that means addition operator requires two operands so i cannot change number of operands required for addition by using operator overloading i cannot send three parameters for performing addition that is not possible you cannot change number of operands you cannot change its precedence also the precedence will also remain same as per the basic precedence precedence table and grouping will also remain same that means it will remain arithmetic operator you cannot group it into some other type of operator this is another important rule and then new operators like star star or less than greater than that is not equal to and or cannot be created you cannot create a new operator a new operator you cannot invent in fact a new operator using operator overloading and then it is basically used to print compile time polymorphism ctp again because it is over uh, compiler will decide that this addition performed on basic data type or it will be performed on object type it is a part of compile time polymorphism so in c plus compile time polymorphism can be implemented by using uh, two methods one is called as one is called as uh, function overloading and other is called as operator overloading so before we proceed i think we should see the example of operator overloading right so um, I will take you to again plus program. Just now we have written the program to perform addition of two complex number by function addition. But this is not that much uh, a user friendly uh, way to write the expression three dot addition in bracket C1 plus C2. Uh, this is not user friendly thing. Instead of this, what if I will be able to write C3 is equal to c1 plus c2 this is more user friendly by reading this uh, user will clearly understand that yes that the programmer wanted to perform addition of c1 and c2 and store the result in c3 but if i do like this and if i compile my program i will get error illegal structure operation error is because we are trying to use the addition operator on objects we will not allow directly so to allow this what we want to have is operator function so now 
instead of writing addition function, we will write operator function. So how to write operator function? We should have some return type like this. So I will decide return type later on. Now name of the function cannot be addition. The name of the function has to be compulsorily operator. You can see operator is a keyword in C++, which is not there in C. It is a new keyword in the C++. And what is the symbol of the operator that I wanted to overload? It is plus. I wanted to perform overloading of addition operator. Right? Now, when I say C1 plus C2, now let us understand very clearly. When we say C1 plus C2, the visibility criteria will change drastically. Visibility criteria will change. Now see how the visibility criteria will change. When I say C1 plus C2, in this case, the plus operator function, plus operator function will be called on object C1. Plus operator function will be called on object C1. When I write C1 plus C2, plus operator function will be called on object C1. Instead of writing C1 plus C2, can we write C2 plus C1? The answer is again yes. But in this case, plus operator function will be called on object C2. In this case, plus operator function will be called on object C2. So let us get back to our first syntax, that is C1 plus C2 then plus operator function will be called on object C1. And now my question is, which objects will be visible in this particular member function? Which objects will be visible in operator functions? Okay, so start giving your answer. I will be uh, observing that how this operator function will do the operation question is when i write c1 which objects will be visible in the operator function and which will not which will not be when i say c1 plus c2 the operator function will be called on object c so which objects will be visible and which will not be visible yeah, I started getting answers. Ketan answered the question. Ketan, am I audible clearly? Ketan, am I audible clearly? Or uh, audio is breaking like yesterday? Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other answer? Ketan said C1 will be visible. <coughs> what about C2 and C3? Yeah, Tanesha came, Tanesha says C1 and C2 will be visible. Any other answer? Think a little bit and start giving answer what I want. Everybody, those who are uh, watching this telecast live, I can see 47 students or maybe other people also. They are observing or they are watching us live, but uh, it is unfortunate to get only two answers. <clears throat> so at least I should get 50% student. I should have 50% student answering to the question that I am asking. Whatever you feel, whatever you feel that this will be answered, type it and post it in the chat box. I will be happy to see answers from many students. Uh, number of students watching live are different. What I must say is the watching this particular uh, video often they are increasing uh, very rapidly. In fact, uh, first two sessions, first session is uh, watched by more than 450 students up till now more than 450 views and second is also watched by more than 400 students so that is good sign that people are at least watching this particular uh, thing offline 
if not directly live yes i started getting answers uh, pranit says c1 c2 and c3 all three are visible jaswin yes jaswin says c1 is visible and c2 is indirectly visible right so again any more answer so i'm says yes c1 is visible good see this is uh, this is uh, actually a reflection point uh, that uh, i will get certain feedback because i will not be able to see your faces so i cannot read that whether whatever i have explained is reached up to you or not and uh, if you answer in whatever way that you like or whatever answer you think then at least i will come to know that uh, how much part that we are discussing is actually reaching to you yes shubham says c1 is visible so very good most of you are saying c1 is visible some of us uh, some are saying that c1 c2 are visible and uh, some are saying even c1 c2 and c3 all three are visible the answer is only c1 will be directly visible in the function operator class only c1 will be directly visible and then c2 will be sent as a parameter now this is a little different thing so normally parameters are required to be specified inside parenthesis when we are calling a function but that is not required over here when we are using operator function then the first object after which we will write operator will be directly visible to the operator function and second object that we write after the operator will be indirectly visible because it will be passed as a parameter to the function so i will write c1 is directly visible to the operator function whereas c2 is indirectly visible and once i say it is sent as a parameter c2 is sent parameter then do we require parameters over here or we require only one parameter since only c2 is sent as a, there is no question of c3 c3 is not this this thing is not written up till now that is c3 equal to will not be well now first the compiler will try to evaluate the expression c1 plus c2 it will try to solve the addition operator there is no question of c3 out of picture right now only we are thinking about c1 and c2 c1 is directly visible c2 is indirectly visible because it has a parameter so we require only formal parameter here. so let's take formal parameter y so complex y will receive the values of object c2 now my dear friends when i write expression over here when i write expression over here uh, something like this uh, let's say uh, r i am writing r then compiler will consider this r of object will this r will be considered as r of c1 or c2 this will be my next question for which you will be answering when i write r over here this r or when i write i over here this i considered of which object it will be considered of object c1 c2 or c3 so start answering yeah just when thank you start answering my question is when i write r inside the operator function compiler will consider this r as a part of c1 as a part of c2 or as a part of c3 the question is very simple if you understood the concept that we have discussed till now you should be able to tell the answer yeah sachin pathak answered c1 any other student oh the uh, count is increasing 55 so many of you came after the ninth breakfast i think so ham shinde said c1 ketan says c1 pranit tanisha says c1 pranit khandekar pranit khandekar says c3 pranit you are from which branch pranit if you are able to listen to me rishab says c2 
any other answer mrudula says c1 mrudula i think from uh, computer computer division a jinal says c1 very good be pranit you are from be i o oh, oh, i know you are from be which branch pranit is from computer oh sorry how how i forgotten you you are in which division pranit says c3 yeah mrudula is from computer a very good so so i can see many people are answering correctly c1 is the correct answer the uh, whenever whenever i write r or whenever i write c uh, i sorry whenever i write r or whenever i write i write i this will be by default considered as r and i of c1 because c1 is directly visible now in this r which is r of c1 i wanted to add r of c2 so i should write y dot r because c2 is copied into y similarly this i will be considered as i of c1 in which i wanted to add i of c2 so i should write y dot i have you understood this thing but the problem is where i should store them because r3 is not uh, sorry c3 is not at all visible so where i should store this this is the problem i hope you have understood that where i should store uh, this particular result after addition because the c3 is not visible so the answer is simple what i will do is i will create a low object inside this function i will say complex t so t is again a comp object created for the class complex. and now we can store the result in the object how to store the result in object t we will write t dot r is equal to this and we will say t dot i is equal to this so now uh, oh, you have understood that we have performed addition and imaginary part but the problem is we have not stored in c3 rather we have stored result in t now we want uh, this t should come back inside the c3 so t should come back inside the c3 and how to bring back inside the c3 we should return this particular complex t or object t from this particular operator function and you know for returning anything we need to write a return command so i should write return t and my dear friends when you when we write a command in our function its a return type cannot be void then what will be return type of this operator function the return type of function should match the data value that you are returning so in this case we are in t and what is data type of t data type of t is complex so return type of this function should be also complex now my now what will happen uh, c1 will be visible directly so r will be of c1 c2 will be visible indirectly so y dot r will be of c2 the result will be stored in t similarly imaginary part so result we actually calculated inside object t but we wanted to get it into object c3 so we will return it by using command and since we are using return command return type cannot be it has to be the class complex so i hope i have understood how i performed operator over let's compile this program okay now i will show you step by step execution of this program for your understanding we'll start clear screen objects are created this will call input function on c1 so it will start execution of c1 it will read real and imaginary part will be stored in c1 object then input is over c2 dot input will again take you back to the input function the input function will be executed again it will take two more numbers as a real and imaginary parts so let's say 4 and 5 then when i say continue now this is what you need to observe when i say c3 is equal to c1 plus c2 this will actually call operator plus function so it will take a jump to operator plus like this okay now uh, while going over here c1 will be directly visible because it the, this function is called on c1 but c2 is not visible so it is uh, passed as a parameter so y will get the value of c2 
and then when when i ask it to proceed it will perform addition of real part addition of imaginary part and then it will return t so we will get the result in c3 and this will take a jump to the display function this will display addition and then that's that will end the program now you can see that uh, 2 plus 4 is 6 and 3 plus 5 is 8 so we are able to perform addition of two objects by using operator this is possible only because of operator function that is operator i hope you have understood what is operator overloading similar to plus addition operator can you overload other operators which are supported yes i can overload minus operator or subtraction like this i can overload multiplication operator i can overload division operator i can overload modulo division operator i can overload and bitwise and i can overload bitwise or i can overload bitwise xor i can overload left shift i can overload right shift i can overload increment i can overload decrement i can overload not operator now now i wanted to ask a question so if you see uh, in c plus or in c the operators are divided into three categories unary op binary operators and ternary operator it is not possible to overload ternary operator this is not allowed question mark color this operator we cannot overload so no question of ternary operators we can overload binary operators like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. We can overload unary operators like plus plus. If I wanted to overload increment operator, unary operator plus plus, then my question is, do we require object to be sent as a parameter? Your answer should be either yes or no. Have you understood my question? If I wanted to load unary operator, like plus plus that is increment operator do we need object to be sent as a parameter do we need object to be sent as a parameter i am expecting answers from you Take your time, but not too much because we are going slow. And we may run out of time. I hope uh, at least today the session is uh, not having any technical issues. No parameters allowed, just when it says Ketan, Tanay, Mrudula, Shreya. Yes, I can see the answers from new uh, Shraddha. Good, that means you are participating. You are alive, you are active. That is what I want that you should understand. Yes, uh, most of you are saying, and the correct answer is also no. Whenever we want to overload unary operators, we really don't want uh, any parameters any object as a parameter because we are calling that operator on the object and that object itself is the only operand required for that particular operator so no parameters required thank you so much yes so we do not require any object as a parameter so i hope uh, that all of you have understood the concept so this completes our operator overloading let's come to the next concept that is friend function so uh, what is friend function uh, this is a picture of friends. Okay, so friend function is basically a function which is defined outside the scope of any class. It is defined outside the scope of a class, uh, but it can have access to all private and protected data members of the class. Now, what is protected? We have not discussed up till now. We will discuss it very soon in the inheritance, right? As well as scope resolution operator. I think somebody has asked about scope resolution operator in the chat box. Amit sir has answered to that question. Anyway, we will touch that point again back in the uh, inheritance programs. So a friend function is basically a function which is required to be defined outside the class scope, but it has a right to access all 
private and protected members of the class so this is something very special about print because we know that private and protected members of a class cannot be accessible from outside the class but friend function is a function which is able to access them is basically known as friend function it is friend to that particular class right then how to how to declare a friend function so this is a declaration syntax not definition syntax declaration is different definition is different so i can declare a friend function by using a keyword friend then that print function may have some return type like a normal function it will have some name it will take parameters and this should end with semicolon because this is declaration not definition so friend function can be declared by using this particular syntax and now this is a declaration of a print function so this declaration i will again uh, stress the word declaration this is not definition again 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 i will repeat this is definition this is declaration this should be required to be present inside the class the declaration required inside the class definition has to be present inside the class so this is a special requirement of a print function the declaration should be present inside the class and definition should be present outside how we will see through the example don't worry it can be declared anywhere inside the class that is there is no restriction that it should be present in the public section only because we know up till now that member functions are declared in the public section but this restriction is not there for the friend function it can be declared in public section or even it can be declared in private section then it is defined outside the class without using keyword friend so now this is i'm stress stressing over here this is declaration not def because whenever you are defining it it should be defined inside the class and it should be defined without using keyword friend. so only while declaring we require friend keyword while define do not require friend keyword then it is required to be declared in all the classes for which it is expected to work as a friend so uh, one function can act as a friend to more than one classes maybe two classes three classes so if i want to have a friend function which should act as a friend for two classes let's say class a and class b then in both the classes it is required to be declared it is required to be declared as friend so now this is important we'll see in the example it takes objects of the classes as parameters so it will take objects of that classes to whom it, it should act as a friend say class a and class b then it should take object of class a and object of class b as a parameter in order to access their private or protected data members or members right so now let us do this it is not in the scope of any object or class that means you need not have to use object name or class name to call it this is important it is not in the scope of a object and class so you have to call it as a normal function suppose name of my friend function is abc then i should not call it by writing x dot abc or i should not call it by using complex dot or scope resolution operator abc i can call abc function directly by writing abc so this is what is different in the friend function so you have to remember these characteristics of the friend function now let us take example let us say i am having two classes there is a class one which is having a private data member a and public member function one what will be this one then if i say member function name is one and class name is also one you should understand that i am having a constructor present over here and then i will declare a member function not define i will declare a member function add by using keyword friend so we want that there, there should be a function add which will act as a friend for this class one then i will have second class let's say class two which will also consist of private data member b this is private so not accessible from outside world and then i will have public member function two and you can see if the name of the member function is two same as class name this is also nothing but what constructor of the class two and i want this add function should act friend to this class also so i will declare it inside friend class uh, sorry class two by using keyword friend so i hope you understood the situation is clear 
we will create object of class one. Let's say X is the object of class one. And we will create object of class two. We, let's say Y is the object of uh, class two. So you know how to create object of class one. We have to write one and then we have to write X. This will create X object of class one. Similarly, I can create Y object of class two, that two dot uh, two space Y. And then I want function add to perform add of private data member of class one and private data member of class two so is something very special thing that we are doing we are trying to access data members of two different classes by using special member function so this is where friend will help me this function i should make friend it will have access to private data member of class one as well as it will have access to private data member of class two and to have the access of both these private data members the friend function add will take object x as a parameter as well as object y also as a parameter and then we can write very well x dot a plus y dot b and store the result in the local basic data type variable c and the function will display the result that is addition of a and b so this is what we wanted to do. so this is not possible by using any normal member function or a normal function to do this special operation we have, have this function as a friend function and well you when we are defining it as a friend we should not use a keyword friend only while declaring we should use keyword friend I hope this idea or the analysis is clear to all. I will just take you to the program and uh, I hope I'm having a, a ready made program. So instead of typing it, uh, I'll just show you that program because it's easy. You can see that I have defined class one, which private member A, and constructor one, which will initialize A to 10. And then uh, you, you see this. This is important. I have uh, declared function add this is declaration only with a keyword friend then i in class 2 which a private member with a private data member b then constructor 2 which will initialize b to 20 and in also you can see i have declared a function add with the keyword friend and then i have defined function add outside all the classes i have defined function add outside all the classes so this function add is not in the scope of class one as well as it is not in the scope of class two. So, but if I say like this, if it is not in the scope of class one as well as class two, that means uh, there are restrictions on this function. It cannot access the private data members of these classes, but we want the, it should be able to access them. And that's why we made it as, a, or we declared it as a friend function. Okay. One thing that I have not explained is like this. What I did over here at the beginning, I done class two semicolon. This is called as something as forward declaration. Forward declaration of a class. And why this is needed? For example, if I do not uh, use it, I will make it a comment. And if I compile my program, what you will find is the error. You can see over here, Whenever we write print add comma one x and two y, up till now in my program, when you see from top, what is being defined? We have defined only class one. Class two is not defined at all up till now. So compile getting the meaning of the word two and its object y. It is not able to understand what does this means two y because it is not knowing at all that there is going to be a class whose and why is going to do that class. This is at not known because we have not written it up till now. So in order to inform the compiler that, that don't give error over here, wait, I am going to find class two and you will find out of that class very soon. What we have to do is at the beginning itself, we have to inform compiler by writing like this, that is class two, which is called as forward declaration. So that compiler understands that class two is just declared. It is not defined yet, but it is going to be defined after some time. So do not give error for this, right? So I hope you understood this thing. So 
uh, in the function add, we will take x so parameter that is object of class one, y as a parameter object of class two, and then we will simply add the private members of x and y, and we will display the result. Okay. So now let us compile this program, and now I will execute step that will understand what exactly will happen. So this will create object of class one, and you know when object is being created will automatically call the constructor so it will jump to the constructor it will initialize a to 10 then when we create object of class this will also call the constructor of class 2 it will jump over here it will initialize b to 20 now clear screen and then you can see or watch carefully over here i am calling a function add and see carefully while calling function add which is a friend function i am not using object name or I am not using class name. It is called as any other normal function in C language. Add in bracket x comma y, where x comma y will act as actual parameters. So when this will happen, it will uh, it will take a jump. It will take a jump to the function add, and then uh, it will perform addition of a and b. This will display the result. Come back to get ch. And what we'll find as a result is t, that is 10 plus 20. So this is the advantage of using a print function. When we want to have a function uh, which will which will get access to both, uh, sorry, private or protected data members of a class, then we can declare that function as a print function. You may say that uh, what will happen if I do not declare this as a friend over here, or declare this as a friend. Over then if I compile my program, this will be the error that scope resolution operator A is not accessible or scope resolution operator B is not accessible. Have you understood this? Saying that private data member of class 1 is not accessible, private data member of class 2 is also not accessible. It is not possible by using normal function. We have to have a friend function to allow this. So I will declare this function as a friend function as well as I will declare this function as a friend function. Then only this will be allowed. So we understood this concept. Uh, let me take the uh, next concept. Uh, please uh, excuse me for just two minutes. Not two minutes also. I will be back. So we will uh, we will resume. Okay, just a short break I, I have taken. So we will proceed. I hope the screen is visible to you and I am clearly audible. So now uh, we have to move on to the next important topic that is called as inheritance. And I will not uh, uh, go into the theoretical details of inheritance because I know many of you as uh, already gone through the concept called as inheritance and you uh, know the definition of inheritance inheritance without any problem so this is basically a uh, inheritance that this says a son i am base class then because of inheritance the son says dad i am derived class so the process of deriving a new class from the existing class is basically called as inheritance and uh, because of this process, what will happen? The derived class will acquire the properties of existing class. The new class will acquire the properties of existing class. The existing class is many a times called as base class. And the new class created will be called as a derived class. So existing class is normally called as a base class, And newly created class will be called as derived class. I hope you understood the definition of inheritance. Inheritance can be implemented in many different types. So the five uh, main types of the inheritance. We can have a single inheritance. We can have multi-level. We can have hierarchical. We can have 
hybrid we can have multiple we can even have multipath which is again a special case hybrid so which we may discuss in a short while so you know that what do you mean by single inheritance single base class is used to derive a single new class then it is a single inheritance then what is multi level a single new class is derived from a single base class which is already derived from another base class then this is called as multi level and then what is multiple inheritance single new class is derived from two existing classes then this is called as multiple inheritance and if i reverse the case that means any new classes are derived from single base class it is called as hierarchical and if i am using of this four to generate a new derived class like this is multi level this is single this is hierarchical oh, sorry this is multiple so it is combination of different types of inheritances this is basically called as hybrid and then this is a special case of hybrid where we are having the hierarchical followed by multiple to derive new class and then there is a problem of duplication of the properties from these two paths so this is a multi path inheritance basically so don't consider this as a separate category you can answer the question that how many types of inheritance are there sing multi level multiple hierarchical and hybrid five types java do not support multiple inheritance directly it will support multiple inheritance through special concept called as interface so you can have both base classes this can be a class but this should be an interface in java in java i am saying it is in java in c++ both of them can be classes so we can have a new class derived from the two base classes this is allowed in c++ in java it is not allowed in java if one is class then other should be interface this is main difference between inheritance of c++ and inheritance of java another difference is in c++ you do not require any special keyword to perform or to uh, to have this particular inheritance in java if you remember we require a keyword known as extends so if i wanted to derive a class from a class in java we require a keyword extends this type of keyword is not required in c++ or if i say this is interface and this is class that means if you want to derive a class from the interface in java we require a keyword whose name is implements so in java there are special keywords required in order to implement inheritance the keyword can be either extends or the keyword can be implements but c++ doesn't require any such special keywords for implementing inheritance so how to implement inheritance in c++ we'll see okay so we can derive a new class from the existing class by using three different access specifiers so again we will come back to the access specifiers now the role of access specifiers here is little different than whatever we have seen previously now they are used for deriving a new class from existing class so now if i say base class is a name of the base class is a and name of this derived class is b then by using private access specifier i i have to write like this let's say class Uh, i may take a little time or my handwriting is not that good because of this touchpad i have to write b then i have to write colon then i have to specify access specifier over here if i want to derive it by using private access specifier then i have to write private over here private and i have to write the base class the name of the base class is a so this is the steps of deriving class b from class a by using private access specifier now what will happen if i derive a class from base class by using a private keyword in this case 
what will be the properties that will get transferred over here and in which section because you know base class can consist of three sections private protected and public as well as a derived class can also consist of three sections private protected, and public so when i derive a class by using private specifier the private data members of this class will not be inherited in any case they will not be inherited the protected members the base class will be inherited by the derived class, but in the private section so they will act as a private members of class b and when i use private derivation even the public members of a base class will be inherited in the private section of the derived class so when i derive class by using private access specifier then protected and public members of a base will be acquired in the private section of the derived class it will not be acquired at all right what if i derive a class using protected instead of private if i use uh, this is class c then if i derive it by uh, access specifier protected then what will happen i will say protected so this is derived protectedly that uh, from a and what is derived is class c so class c colon protected then what will happen if i derive it protectedly then again private will not be inherited private data members or member from member functions of the base class will not be inherited protected will be inherited in the protected section of the derived class and even public will be inherited in the protected section of the derived class okay and when i derive a class publicly even now also private will not be inherited protected will be inherited in the protected section of the public and public of the base class will be inherited in the public section of the derived class so uh, we can have three types of access modifiers access specifiers to derive a new class from the existing class so i hope you have understood that what will happen if i derive it like this right now let us take one example of the inheritance uh, let us consider that i am having a class student this is a base class we are considering this as a base class so to save the time i have directly kept the program on the slide so that we will discuss it over here only and this class student is having data members role number name and then i have not specified any access specifier over here so the rule is if you do not specify any access specifier by default the access specifier will be considered as private so by default all the members of the class are private members of the class unless and until you do not specify it they will be considered as private so these are private data members of the class student then i will have a member functions in the public section so i will have a member function get student info which will read role number from the user and which will read name of the student from the user then i will have display student info which will just simply display role number of a student and name of a student so i hope this is clear then we will derive a class from the student class like this is a derived class let's say class exam is the new class that i am creating colon i am right i am using public access specifier and base class is student so what will happen that uh, private data members will be inherited because in any case private data members or private will not be inherited in the derived class the public member functions will be derived here now this class is having its own data members in the public part this is interesting that is marks in physics marks in chemistry marks in marks in maths and it is having its own member functions also get marks and display marks so get marks will get the marks in three subjects display marks will display the marks in three subjects so this is also a simple class derived class from class student then i will derive one more class that is class result but you can see this class is not derived from student class rather it is derived from exam class that means what we are having right now is we are having a type of a class diagram this will be a student class from the student class we have derived other class 
that class name exam. And from the exam class, we are deriving a new class again. And then this class is having name result. So basically, we are seeing the example of which inheritance this is having name result. So this is basically a multi-level inheritance. A derived class is used to create new class. The exam is an already derived class and it is used as a class for creating a new class. Then this is called as multi-level. So we are going through the example of multi-level inheritance. So in class result, what we are having is again one more data member total, the public section and one member function show result. Uh, add the marks of physics, chemistry, and maths, and will display the total marks of the student. So I hope you have understood these three classes that we have created or used in this particular program. And then we will see main, void main. What we are doing is in void main, we are creating object of a result class. So this is important. We are creating object of a result class. Now, when I say obj, that is object of result class, dot get the student info, what will happen if you observe the result class result class doesn't consist of this particular member function get student info then will it be allowed to be called or not the answer is yes why it is allowed to be called because of inheritance what will happen the get student info which is present in the base class that is student class is basically inherited here in the exam class so get student info which is the data member function of student because of inheritance it will be acquired by the exam class in the public section so get student info will be present over here and then we are creating a result class so this from this it will be again acquired by whom it will be acquired by this that is result class so though it is not directly visible over here it is present because it is acquired because of inheritance similar explanation is there for get marks similar is for get student info display student info similar is for display marks and then finally we will display show result this is a clear-cut call because show result is actually the uh, member function of the class result so for that any, any inheritance is not required but to call these member functions by using obj which is object of a derived class result what is required is inheritance we need to uh, inherit the functions from base class to the derived class derived class to the derived class so i hope i think this is already there uh, in my uh, c++ ide if it is there we will definitely have a look at it quickly I don't have so I hope you understood this from this slide so this is one example I have I will take for the uh, inheritance which is nothing but what multi multi level inheritance okay we are having still half an hour so I should continue with the uh, remaining part uh, we should discuss about uh, virtual function now uh, this is very important uh, concept that we should learn what is a virtual function because this is a question asked many a times in the interviews placement interviews that do you know the concept of virtual function do you know the virtual keyword so a C++ virtual function is a member function in the base class. now this is very important it is a member function in this class that you redefine in the derived class it is the member function of the base redefined in a derived class and it is declared by using keyword virtual it is declared by using keyword virtual okay so now where it is required to be declared by using keyword virtual it is required to be declared virtual in the base class in the derived class we did not have to declare it by using keyword virtual it is required to be declared virtual in the 
base class, not in the derived class. It is used to tell the compiler to perform dynamic linkage. Now, this is dynamic binding, or this is also called binding, or this is the concept required to implement something called as RTP. So, what is RTP? It is runtime polymorphism. So when we wanted to implement runtime polymorphism, that is that means late binding, that means dynamic linkage, we need the virtual function. See how the virtual function will help us in implementing these all concepts. We'll go through the examples. Then when a function is made virtual, uh, the C++ determ determines which function is to be invoked at the runtime. Therefore, this is implementing RTP, runtime polymorphism. So, which function will be invoked will be decided during the execution of the program and not during the compilation of the program in order to specify or in order to implement runtime polymorphism. In the example, we will see. There are some characteristics of the virtual function which are like this, that it must be a member of some class. Actually, it should be a member of a base class with a keyword virtual and derived class also, but without keyword virtual. Then it cannot be a static member. You cannot write static virtual function. That is not possible. And they are accessed through object pointers. We cannot access them by using object. We have to access them by using object pointer. And they can be friend. The virtual function can be a friend function. And then uh, we cannot have a virtual constructor. Virtual constructor is not possible. But virtual destructor is possible. We can have destructor virtual but we cannot have constructor virtual. So these are some of the characteristics which I wanted to just specify over here so that you will understand a little bit about a virtual function. We will see the example of the virtual function quickly. So now let us let me explain the scenario clearly first so that you will understand what is the problem and how uh, we are making use of a virtual function. I hope uh, up till now my audio is clear, video is also clear, so there will not be any objection. Actually, it is not in my hand. Uh, anyways, it is network issues that I am facing. But anyway, I should take care that you you should get it, uh, get these all things uninterrupted. So anyway, so let me explain uh, this particular example first. So I I have a class whose name is shape, and I wanted to use as a base class okay so I'm to have a base class whose name is shape and then base class I will have two data members team one and team two team one and team two basically stands for dimension one and dimension two I want that that shape can be defined by using two dimensions dimension and dimension two and interestingly I have declared him in the protected section. So why not in private? We will see very soon. And this will give you idea about protected keyword. And then I will I will decide it to have two data or sorry member functions. One is get data. Obviously, it will be for initializing the values for dimension one and dimension two. And other member function area, which will be used to calculate area of that particular shape. So this is my planning. I wanted to have a class shape like this. Can we define class shape like this in our program? I will take you again to the C++ IDE. I will start by uh, this hash include iostream.h. I will write hash include on io.h.
can see i am trying to keep uh, the uh, you can say identifier concept same as java that method name should start with lower case and with consisting of multiple words then first character of second word should be capital class name should be capital these all uh, conventions are not there in c++ in c++ but they are there in java and in order to avoid any confusion i will i can keep same uh, naming concepts in c++ also in get data uh, what i will do is i will ask the user or uh, i will not uh, contact the user let's say it will take two parameters let's say d1 and d2 to make it more simple and short and we will directly write uh, d1 is equal to d1 and i will write uh, d2 is equal to d2 like this and then i wanted to define a method whose name is area the question is what i should uh, write inside this function area what is the equation i should use to calculate the area of the shape have you understood the question can you guess what i should write over here give me your answer what command i should write in the area function that i am defining in class shape can we can we use any expression can we use any formula to calculate the area of a shape this question is for you can you suggest what i should write inside the function area what command i should write inside the function area start posting your suggestions in the chat box i'm waiting for your suggestions i'm not getting answer up till now you understood the question clearly i want you to just that what i should write inside the body of this function area what i should write over here no suggestions up till now waiting for you jinal what do you say shubham tanay ketan jaswin कोई तो जवाब दो वॉट डू यू एक्सपेक्ट टू बी प्रेजेंट इन द बॉडी ऑफ फंक्शन एरिया इज इट अट वर्क decided not to give answer anyways okay so you keep thinking
I will give you is that the most what we can do over here and we cannot write any formula because we don't know the geometry of the shape so how I can write some formula and I will calculate the shape so this is how I will define class shape I hope you have understood how I have defined class shape let us uh, come back to our slide so this is over we have defined the base class now we wanted to derive a class from this base class let's say we wanted to derive class a rectangle so this will be a derived class from this base class I will derive it by using the access specifier public so I will derive rectangle class from shape class publicly so what will happen if I derive it publicly the protected the protected data members of base class will be acquired in the protected section of derived class and public member functions will be acquired in public section of the derived class so rectangle class will automatically get a member function get data it will get the member function area that is acquired from shape and this rectangle class can have its own area function where we can define the formula to calculate the area of rectangle right so let us derive or let us define this class I hope you have understood the analysis that I have done so I will define another class now so let's define a class let's say class uh, rectangle I wanted to derive it publicly so I will write colon public class shape so I will write class shape then I do not require any data member to be present over here because automatically what will happen dim1 and dim2 uh, sorry I will write dim2 they will be required then I, I, I will require one public member so I will write public I will require a member function to area of a rectangle so I will write void area and this I will write C out we will write what area of a rectangle is equal to and I will write uh, dimension 1 into uh, dimension 2 so this will calculate and display area of rectangle and now you can see though this class consists of only one mem member function area what will happen because of inheritance this class will also acquire the get data sorry get data member function of the shape class as well as it will also acquire area member function of base class so there will be area methods present or two area functions present in rectangle class similar to the rectangle class i will try and there or define one more class whose name will be let's say triangle and i will derive it publicly by writing let's say public shape here also i will not have any data member because d1 and d2 will be acquired i will write a public member function uh, that will be again void area and inside this area now i can define formula for calculating area of triangle assuming dimension one and dimension two is height i can say that area of a triangle is equal to and i can write uh, 0 0.5 into dimension one into dimension two Right. I will close this I will close this class also so I have created all three classes now we will write void main and then uh, we will create uh, the object of class shape by writing shape s we will create object of class uh, rectangle by writing rectangle r we will create object of class triangle by writing triangle T so these are objects of the three uh, classes then I can initialize the object of shape class by writing s dot get data there is absolutely no problem I can call area function of shape class by writing s dot area okay now uh, when I write 
r dot get data this will initialize r object by using get data method so let us do it quickly then i can write r dot area this will call area method of a rectangle class and it will calculate area of rectangle then i will write t dot get data this will initialize triangle object then i will calculate area of triangle by writing t dot area and then i will write get ch and i will close before this i will write clr scr now fine i hope you understood what i have done i will compile this program no, 12 errors Oh, while calling uh, get data function, I have to send the parameters. Let's say 10 and 20 for shape. Let's say 3 and 5 for rectangle. And let's say 4, 8 for triangle. Anyway, so I hope having this uh, this program already existing. Uh, go to that instead of spending time over here. Ah, yes. So this is what uh, we did just uh, just now. The same program that I have written. Okay, but uh, I have made some changes over here while calling. So now uh, the classes remain same. But now you can see when I'm uh, calling, when I'm calling the functions, I'm using very important concept that is called as uh, pointer to object. So now you can see uh, here I said shape star s. This will not create object s. This will create pointer s of type shape star. So this object can this object s can point to class object okay so this any shape class object so for creating it i am using shape star s then i am creating objects for class rectangle and triangle now when i say when i want to call member function by using pointer now remember s is not the object s is a pointer when we want to call member function by using pointer we should not use dot operator this will be error dot operator is not used for calling member function by using pointer for member function by using pointer we require indirection operator that is uh, minus greater than so this operator is when we wanted to invoke member function or members of class member of a class by using pointer whenever i wanted to access member of a class by using pointer then we cannot use dot operator we have to use indirection operator so when i say s indirection get data it will call get data method of the base class then s indirection area it will call area method of base class now uh, this is a new thing that we are doing that s is equal to and r what is happening because of this we are saying that uh, the pointer s will point to object r and r is the object of which class r is the object of rectangle class so now i am saying base class pointer s is a base class pointer because we declare it or created it by using shape star s base class pointer is pointing to the object of derived class now if i say s dot indirection get data which get data will be called and then when i say s indirection area which area will get called because now you can see in the uh, rectangle function i am having uh, its own area 
as well as we have acquired get data function from the shape class as well as we have acquired area function from the base class or shape class so this rectangle function uh, sorry rectangle class now consists of two area definitions one that one area this is acquired this is acquired from shape and another area that is its own this area function is its own now the question is when i say s in direction area whose area will be called will it call the area function of rectangle class or area function which it which is acquired from shape class so this is the thing that we wanted to resolve so what do you think what is your answer if i say s in direction get data it will invoke get data but there are no two of get data so absolutely no problem but when i say s in direction area it is trying to call area function and my problem is in the rectangle there are two area functions one is acquired from shape class and other is own so which area will be called will it call acquired from shape or it will call its own this is again a question for you. All right. Uh, so uh, the errors you specified. I, I also came to know them very quickly after I closed that program. But anyway, it's the same program I have opened as a predefined thing or pre-written program. So Jasmine says it will call its own area function. That means this, this will call area function rectangle class and it will display area of rectangle. Okay. So let's let's see that uh, Jasmine's answer is correct or not. I will not reveal the answer uh, right now. Jasmine has said as a S in direction area, this will call area of uh, a rectangle class. Okay. And then uh, after some time after this i have said s is equal to and t that means the pointer s is now pointing is now pointing to object t and object t is the object of triangle class now triangle class will also have the same thing it has acquired it has acquired get data method the base class and it has also acquired a method from the base class so triangle class will have two definitions of area one is acquired from shape so this is acquired from shape class and other is its own so now whether this will call area of a triangle its own method or it will call area of a shape now this is interesting to see and this is where you will come to know the significance of a virtual function let us compile our program you will see that there is no error i will execute this program step by step so that you will understand it very clearly we will start with main clear screen now objects are created when i say s in direction get data uh, s is object of base class so without any confusion this will call get data or the base class you can see we have came into the base class shape so oh, sorry so it will initialize dimension one dimension two by the values of d1 and d2 then we will come back s in direction area this will again call area of shape we are in the area of shape this will display this message that shape of shape not defined therefore area is equal to zero and then now pointer s will point to object r now it is pointing to the object of rectangle class so when i say s in direction get data this will take you to the get data function again because there is single copy no multiple copies this will initialize dimension one and dimension two of the rectangle and now here you have to concentrate when i say s in direction area which area will be executed now see when i ask it to continue See where it has taken you. Is that is it taking you to the area of rectangle 
or area of shape it has taken you to area of shape so when i ask it to continue shape not defined area will be equal to zero this is what will be executed then when i when i point it to triangle object again get data will initialize base and height when i say s in direction area will it take you to the triangle object no triangle name this will again take you to the shape class area method and therefore my dear friends when we complete the execution of this program we will find all three times the answer displayed is shape not defined area is equal to zero what this means this means uh, function writing what we are having is uh, whenever the derived class consists of two functions there are two functions there will be void area which is acquired from shape and void area its own method now you can see derived class will consist of two member functions with same name as well as same type signature there is no difference in type signature also derived class consisting of more than one member functions with same name as well as same type signature then this is something called as a uh, function overriding then in this case whenever we call the function such kind of a function then always what will happen base class function will override derived class function you can see actually or logically what jaswin says is correct what should be called area of class should be called but when i say s in direction area calling area of rectangle rather it is again calling area of class that means what is happening the area of the rectangle class or area of a triangle class is over overridden by the area of shape class i understood what i am saying area of derived class is overridden by area of base class or member function of base class is overriding member function of derived class so derived class member function is hidden it is not accessible so uh, my pointer is pointing to the object of derived class then also i will not be able to access area this is because of s when compiler is the member function and it observes s as the pointer which is a base class pointer it will automatically taking you base class member function right to avoid this what we this s in direction area should call area of class whereas this s in direction area call area of a triangle class how we can achieve it this can be achieved by using the concept known as virtual function now see how it can be achieved what change i will do is simply i will declare this void area which is present in the base class as a virtual function i will write virtual void area now if i compile my program by making this change i will get this type of thing where uh, now when there is no compilation error but when i try to run it definitely uh, let's check it will say abnormal program termination yes so now it is not executing my program properly but it is not giving any compile time error also the problem is if the function is virtual if a member function is virtual you cannot call it by using object or pointer so this line is basically creating a problem and saying abnormal program termination so this is where you should be careful if the function is virtual function you cannot call it by using object or you cannot call it by using the pointer so if i make this as a comment and if i compile my program again there is absolutely no problem and now if i execute the program step by step like this it will start from main clear screen objects are created get data no doubt there is no problem it will call because it is not a virtual function it will initialize now s is equal to and r pointer s will point to object r this will again take you to the get data it will initialize dimension 1 and 2 and now see when we say call area function by using pointer s see where it will take you so now you can see it is taking you to the area function of rectangle class 
So, oh, sorry. We will take you to the area function of the rectangle class. So, area of rectangle will be calculated. Now, S is equal to and T. Now, get data will be called. It will initialize the object. Now, S in direction R, area, will not call area of rectangle. But this will take you to the area of triangle. The area of triangle will be executed. And then finally, end of approach. So we can see area of rectangle calculated is 6, area of triangle calculated is 15. So this is something as a runtime polymorphism. Why this is called as runtime polymorphism? I will tell you. When we will compile this program, let us say this, when we will compile this program, the compiler will resolve the function calls during compilation process. What it will see, the call is like this, S in direction area. So what? decision taken by the compiler which fun area main function will be called since s is the pointer of a base class compiler will decide for this function call it will call area of shape again when it comes here here also it will find it is finding the same function call s in direction area s is a pointer of the base class so compiler will decide that in this time also at this time also it will call area function from base class so this is what the decision taken by the compiler during compile time but when we actually start execution of the program like this up till now what is the compiler's uh, decision stop whenever it sees s in direction area call the area shape whenever it sees s in direction area call the area of shape class but now during execution you can see during execution this statement will be executed before we call area by using s and because of this statement what is happening that s is not pointing to the base class object rather s is pointing to the derived class object rectangle therefore uh, when it is calling s dot area over here now it has to change the decision that it has already taken compile time that for this function call it will call area shape but since now s is not pointing to uh, object rather it is pointing to rectangle class object it cannot call area of shape it has to call area of rectangle and this change is happening during execution of the program therefore this is called as runtime polymorphism and why it is called as late binding because uh, the early binding is done at the compile time but this binding is not new not known during compile time it is just now decided very late after compilation so this is called as late binding and why this is called as a dynamic binding we will see so s in direction area will not call area of shape rather it will call area of uh, rectangle like this it will calculate area of rectangle now again the dynamically the pointer pointing to the object is changed now it is pointing to the triangle class object so when again s in direction area call comes now compiler has to change the decision again earlier case may here what the compiler has taken the decision call the area function of rectangle class can it came keep keep the same decision over here no because now it is forced to change the decision because of this command during runtime that means the binding it has performed earlier during runtime is now required to be changed immediately over here so therefore it is called as dynamic binding this time when we say call area by using s same pointer it will take you to the triangle and this is how the binding is keep on changing and it is happening at runtime therefore this is called as a runtime polymorphism and you can see without a virtual function this may not be possible because if i do not make this function virtual what will happen this area function will override area functions of rectangle class and triangle class. It will not allow the execution of them. So in order to allow the execution of them, we have to make it virtual. But if you see, if I make it virtual, we will not be able to call it by using shape class object or, point or, object or pointer. So if we are not able to call it at all, why to keep its definition? Why it is needed? So mainly what is done 
is not able to be executed, then this is the definition of this function will be removed and it will be assigned with the value zero. If I do this, then this is something called as pure working function. So whenever I am having a virtual function without a function body and assigned to some constant value like zero, then that will be considered as your virtual function let me compile my program again and if i again i will get the same output area of rectangle is 6 and a triangle is equal to 15. so i hope uh, you have understood the concept of uh, virtual function and pure virtual function i we are uh, running out of time by some amount uh, so what i think is the feedback form link uh, is already given to you. Uh, yes, some questions are already answered by uh, our moderators, Deshpande sir, Amit sir, very good. So please give your feedback. Uh, in I will take you to back to my presentation. So this is what we just now implemented by using virtual function. And then, thank you so much. These are the things that I to discuss with you during these sessions i already told you there are references that you have to refer either you can go for a book by bal Swami or you can go for a book by kesho Dattatri, or you can contact me you can send your queries directly through email my email id i have given at the bottom uh, you can contact me uh, i am always uh, you can say waiting for the questions from the student on different topics which are related to C++. So start referring the books and websites now onwards. Uh, make use of this free time very well and uh, prepare yourself uh, better for the placement intern because the competition is uh, was going to be very tough. You know the job situations are very difficult in this but because of this particular corona problem uh, the companies are reducing their employees and you are trying to get in so you should be very very competitive you should be very proficient so make use of this free time at at the best prepare all the subjects fundamental concepts of all different subjects and then crack the interview to get a better job so thank you so much uh, i will take you to the moderators so, Deshpande, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mandar, sir, for uh, such a fantastic uh, session on C++. And the best part is that you have uh, covered almost all important features of C++. Now, I think right. it is left uh, to uh, our uh, students. And what I suggest is that uh, um, uh, they should appeal, uh, rather will should, should challenge to their uh, curiosity quotient and uh, start asking and thinking about why and by challenging their uh, intellect quotient they should try to address how so this why and how is very important as they say correct, that correct. if uh, if you follow your why the others will start mm -hmm. following you so my dear friends you start putting the queries uh, to all of us and we will try our best to an uh, answer your uh, queries thank you correct thank you very much thank you so thank you so much thank you amit for being there Thank you, Deshpande, sir. So we will end our session here. Bye-bye.